Hello everybody, welcome to this month's Future in Space Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, right down there, see? And we are here today to talk about what else but the future of space. And in particular, we're going to be discussing the future of X-ray space astronomy with a group of people who are putting together what is hopefully going to be our next generation flagship X-ray observatory uh, to be put up in space, and we, you know, we've tried to bring you lots of these projects as they are being conceived for the upcoming decadal survey, which we've told you about many, many times. I'm going to have Harley talk to you about just a little bit more in a minute, but uh, today we've got people to talk about the future of X-ray astronomy. So, uh, let, without any more ado, let me get uh, Harley up here and. Um, and he can tell you a little bit more about what we're talking about. Harley, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. So um, our audience is in for a real treat this afternoon, a continuing treat. Um, as uh, Tony briefly mentioned, um, and so I'll, so I'll fill in a little bit, about a year and a half ago, the Astrophysics Division at uh, NASA headquarters paneled and funded uh, four major studies to assess, to identify the key scientific goals, exciting scientific goals, key technology areas, basic designs of uh, four candidate major astrophysics missions that will be submitted in, a, in round numbers in about two years from now to the National Academy of Sciences um, to their decadal survey process. It is an absolutely critical step uh, that, that is taken for all of uh, NASA's major space science and earth science missions. Um, we've had uh, two already um, within the past couple of months, a, um, a large aperture UV um, optical IR observatory and a um, uh, mid-infrared and uh, far-infrared um, space observatory. Today we're in for one of the most exciting areas of research, um, X-ray astronomy. Um, has a has I think if my memory serves, and maybe Alexi, our two guests, Alexi and Ferry, will remember better than I, I think X-ray astronomy was one of the very first um, areas of space astronomy decades ago and has been uh, one of the most productive uh, by far. X-ray astronomy, as you'll hear from our experts today, um, uh, probes the uh, most energetic and most some of the most important processes in all of astrophysics. And again, the, our two guests will be able to enlarge on that um, uh, much more than, than I can. Uh, our audience has a ringside seat on the important process and the development of these four concepts because we will be visiting them again in about a year when they are in the, on the eve of um, submitting their designs to the, to the, um, uh, the National Academy. So please stay tuned. And so... All right. Tony, yeah, great. Uh, you guys may notice, may remember, a stranger in the group <laughs> that we haven't seen in a while, our, our, our sometimes co-host, Dr. Alberto Conti. He's down at the bottom of our little Brady Bunch screen there. Hi, Alberto. Where, how have Hi, you, what have you been up to lately? You've been, uh, you've been busy, was, right? The reason, yeah, I've been so busy. The reason why I wasn't um, able to join the last few uh, Hangouts was because I was on a business trip in the United Kingdom where we, were, we had... Uh, about 19 days of events uh, uh, um, uh, centered on James, James West Space Telescope. So I supported those events. It was uh, was a really, really fun to do. You're going to be on BBC back. Sky at night, aren't you? I will be on BBC Sky now. How I you know saw that? your Twitter feed. That's right. That's exciting. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, I was, We were interviewed by BBC and then by BBC Sky Night, which is really, really cool, actually, for the telescope. So lots of things. So that's part of the role that I play. And so sometimes I won't be able to join this. But I'm really happy I'm back, Tony. So. Oh, good. Well, it's good to have you back, Alberto. It's really cool. Now, I want to remind everybody that we want you to interact with our guests. And, I'm, and we are streaming on a variety of platforms. So please use the... Chat box is there. I'm already seeing my good friends, John Suffolk, Peter Quinn, and I believe, yeah, there he is. Adam Synergy is there. So uh, you guys can go ahead and just ask us questions. And uh, Carl Clark is with us, too, driving the Internet. He's going to help you uh, get your questions read out and, and uh, asked about. We're also on Twitter using the hashtag Future in Space. So please ask our, our guests questions this way. So let me go ahead and get to our, uh, and get to our guests. So here... Um, our guests today are from a, like I said, we're going to be talking about a new 
flagship X-ray space telescope. And to talk about that is uh, Dr. Alexei Viglinen. Uh, he's an astronomer at the uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Also with his, with me is Dr. Faryal uh, Ozel. She is also an astronomer, but she is at the University of Arizona. So thank you guys for joining us. And let me, who should I start with? Who wants to give us a little bit of background on what Lynx is and when you're and, and what you're hoping to get done with it? Who wants to go? I'll start. Okay. So, Lynx is our uh, pretty ambitious next generation X ray mission. Um, right now, the biggest telescope that we have that can see down to the, um, the faintest objects um, in X rays is the Chandra X ray telescope. And we're looking for the next, uh, next generation big space telescope that can actually keep giving us information about the X-ray universe. And as Harley said in his introduction, um, X-rays probe the most energetic phenomena in the universe, the most interesting objects in my view, of course I'm biased. Um, <laughs> they, we can look at black holes, we can look at how galaxies turn up their gas and send it into the intergalactic medium. We can look at the very early stages of the universe and uh, figure out how things form there. So a lot of interesting things can be learned from X-rays, but I guess luckily for us, um, our, our atmosphere is opaque to X-rays. Um, that's why we don't, we don't get the damaging radiation on us. However, um, in order to study the universe, of course, we have to go above, the, um, above our atmosphere. And that's why X-rays are a naturally future, like, it's space-based um, uh, telescope. So, of course, our future in space is going to include the, the next big X-ray mission. So that's what we're hoping to do with Lynx. Um, a big team of people uh, put together by NASA, um, working out all the science and the technology needs of what such a mission might, um, might look like, what, what, what it might need, and um, putting together this concept for the Decado mission. Okay, Alexi, is it possible, can you give us a little bit of uh, background on what we're doing now in x-rays? Give us a little background of, you know, what's what's going on up in space right now? What do we have? And, and maybe say a few words about how Lynx will improve what we're doing. Okay, yeah, so we have two big uh, missions. One is the under x-ray observatory. It's uh, one of the series of NASA great observatories in the you know, late 1980s, 1990s. Um, so it's very sensitive. It can observe a very wide variety of phenomena from solar systems to very, very high in redshift to cosmology. Um, by all, uh, you know, measures, it's actually a tiny telescope. It's, it's a, it's a technological model in space, but it's effective area is about, uh, is equivalent to about 15 inch optical telescope, something that, you know, probably a lot of users a lot of viewers has in their backyards. So um, uh, there's a big room of improvement, you know, when we are able to build uh, observatories like Lynx with square meters of effective area, we can bring the sensitivities and our observational capabilities to an entirely new level. And this is what we are planning to accomplish. Um, so in addition to Chandra, there is a similarly sized uh, European observatory called XMM Newton. Uh, it doesn't have as sharp mirrors as Chandra does. It has a little bit more of effective area. Um, we have a few smaller satellites. Uh, Ferial is involved in NICER. That's a very nice small mission just put on the on the space station to look at the uh, variability of uh, neutron stars. Um, now, we did a hangout on that, didn't we, Alberto? I'm sorry, uh, Harley, uh, on, yep, yep, I, on NICER? Way, um, way, way, months, way, way months, back. months ago. Right, so yeah. yeah, you might want to look through our playlist, guys, on that. That was, uh, that was That's on the ISS, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right, that's correct. Right. Okay. Anyway, so in addition to these two major missions, uh, uh, XMM, Newton, and Chandra, there's a few projects that are active or has recently ended or failed, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that address various aspects of the field, but none addressing, is addressing, you know, the X-ray astronomy on big scale and in its entirety. 
so Adam Synergy is asking a question. I'd like to. I was going to ask you next, so I'll just. I'll. I'll, I'll put uh, his. I'll read his question out. He wants to know how long Chandra is expected to operate for. How and and I'll extend that. How long has it been up, and how much longer is it, is it expected to last? So I can I can take it. Okay. So we are we are approaching twenty year universe, anniversary of the launch. Twenty years, is, really that long? Yeah, nineteen ninety nine. Time flies. Yeah, <laughs> time, time flies. We, people are getting older. Yeah. yeah. So wow. uh, there's uh, there's slow degradation of some of the you know spacecraft components, but nothing critical. There is a degradation of one of the science instruments, yeah. but again, it's not uh, it's not affecting the critical science capability. So uh, hard to predict what you know what the satellites do in space. <laughs> well, uh, how, where is it? Where is Chandra? Chandra is on the. It's on the high, uh, high. It's called high apogee orbit. So it goes underneath uh, Earth radiation belts uh, every uh, three days, but then spends most of the time, I think, like almost halfway to the moon. Yep. That's right. Wow. So I, I know. So I know this already because the other thing I was going to ask is, you know, the, the, the people might not realize the primary mission was only five years, uh, and so we're on its twentieth. And I know this well because Northrop Grumman built uh, built Chandra, right? And so yeah. we're we're very proud of the fact that it's still yeah, up there. Drama. Well, I'll bet you're also relieved for another reason. It's been up there for twenty years. And yep. I don't think it's ever been serviced, right? So, Correct. And so when people ask uh, about JWST, you're right there, Tony. <laughs> exactly right. People say, "Well, we can. We have an, actually no, but it's good because we have another example of what a uh, company can do." Yes. Yeah, so for those of you who are worried, as I am constantly worried about JWST, about the, the fact that we cannot service it, that doesn't preclude. We've got experience with space telescopes lasting a very, very long time. We've got the SOHO spacecraft right. at the L1 point looking at the sun, although it just got hit by a CME. And then there is the, um, there is the, uh, uh, the Chandra Space Telescope. 20 right. years Spencer. without. But, Spencer. And Spencer, and Spencer but okay now, but it, it, it could use a little help, right? It ran out of coolant, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. So yeah. yeah sure. So yeah. out of coolant though. So it wasn't an unexpected. Story. Correct. Correct. It correct. was. It was. It did what it was supposed to do. And it was back to get a little warmer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, it appears. To, so for those who are interested in using X-ray astronomy, like you know, to like you guys are to study the universe, what are the biggest astronomy questions that you hope X-ray astronomy will help answer? And I'll give that to anybody. So I'll take that. Um, I mean, it's, of course, uh, a question that one can answer in many different ways. I'll just take one stab at it. We've been talking um, a little bit about JWST and how excited we all are that it's going to see the first galaxies that are forming in the universe. Um, galaxy formation is a pretty complicated process. Um, it's not just gas cooling and coming together and forming stars. Uh, those stars then have um, formed black holes, um, they have winds, they explode in supernovae, and that, those processes, uh, these high-energy processes, produce a lot of energy that then shapes how galaxies form. So to get a complete picture of galaxy formation, we love to look at the stellar component, which JWST is designed to do, and go back to redshifts of 10, 9, 8, and really map this out. But there's also this hot component, this invisible component, uh, as we like to call it, that plays a huge role in how galaxies came to be what they are today. And X-rays are the only way to see them. So I would say one of the biggest outstanding questions um, uh, that is left for X-ray astronomy right now is, how did these galaxies get shaped by, by these violent events that started as early as the first star started? Um, so um, one of the major drivers of links is to be able to map this history of galaxy formation and really work in tandem with JWST. Yeah. Even though, of course, it's, it's meant to be a mission that's later in time, it still can provide the missing links that... Um, we won't be able to get from looking at infrared alone. Okay, and so the uh, I just want to complete a comment when we're, while we were on it from uh, 
uh, Adam Synergy, he's saying that we've got nicer Louvoir links. That's three out of four mission concepts we've had on these Hangouts. And then uh, Alberto corrected, and we've also had the fourth, which was the Origin Space Telescope, yeah. right? So we've had them all, folks. We've got them all here, and we've all we've talked about all of them. And I don't know. this. I, I made the mistake before the Hangout started of calling what you guys are doing, writing a proposal. But can you give us a sense <laughs> of, and it's not, it's, a, it's a much, as Harley corrected me, it's much more... Um, involved in that. What What are you guys doing right now with links uh, to get ready for the decadal survey? It's not writing a proposal, but it's doing something else. No, so so yes, we uh, we did uh, we did a pretty thorough survey of the science that this observatory should be doing. So Ferial described one of our pillars um, in the science case. Um, we have determined how big a telescope. We need what kind of telescope we need to address those science goals. We uh, established the technological requirements for the optics. We are looking at the suite of science instruments that is capable to make the observations that will be needed to address those science questions. And uh, uh, our uh, NASA center, the Marshall Space Flight Center that is associated with the LINK study, they are doing the spacecraft design. Okay, and so you, you so you've pretty much gotten your science questions or your science uh, what's the word your science requirements uh, yeah. uh, defined. Okay. But, yeah, we have our science drivers, but um, there is an ongoing process of translating those science drivers and what observations need to be carried out in order to answer them to what the observatory requirements are. And the observatory is the general term for. Uh, what is made up of the mirror system, which in itself is a technological challenge, and the suite of instruments that, that analyze the light that, um, that are collected by those mirrors. So um, it is, a, of course, it's a science and technology definition team that uh, Alexei and, and I are chairing, and we're working with a very large group of people who are volunteering their time, uh, both on defining the science and putting the, the technology, uh, developing the technology that's necessary to make this happen. Right, that's the that's STDT, cool. right? <laughs> that you remember that of. Right. STDT, yes. <laughs> yeah, I always have to be real, I'd say that really slowly. But um, I would ahead, have to Alberto. say, sorry, can, I was going to add one thing, which is the, the T in there, the technology is very important because they're not just proposing the science case, they're also proposing uh, yeah. what's called reference missions. You know, how would it look like? What would the, I mean, they can tell you much more details than they should. You know, what actually the telescope will look like, how it will function, how it will operate down to, you know, communications and so on. So it's a very complex process, which is, you know, calling the proposal. It's uh, really diminishing its value. I think. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit more because we've, I, for those of you who didn't see the other hangouts where we talked about what the Cato surveys have to go through, the there's this process where you've set your science goals, but you now need to set, well, what do we need to be able to meet those science goals? And there was a term, and Alberto and Harley, I'm sure you can remember what it was, but when you, when you, you know what the technology is that you need, it's a but it's not there yet. Level. Say TRL. that again. Technology readiness level. That was TRL. It. That was it. Technology, re technology readiness level. Right. And are most of the Lynx technologies at a point where there's no cause for concern that you can, for example, focus x-rays the way you want them to be focused and or reflected or things like that? So um, our technologies, the good news is that there are a few technologies that need to be developed uh, for links um, in the sense that there is the optics portion of it. Uh, we will need different type of mirrors than what, what, for example, Chandra is made up of. And there are the instrument portions of it. Um, so the number of unique technology development requirements is small, but it's a mixed bag within that. So some of the instruments are at a pretty high technology readiness level already. Uh, we have every confidence um, that we could manufacture them in a decade or so to the specifications that, that we might need. Um, the lowest one right now is the lightweight X-ray optics. Um, as our listeners probably know, um, X-ray mirrors are a very different beast than uh, optical infrared mirrors. Um, so what, what we need to do in order to collect x-rays is actually orient mirrors perpendicular, almost perpendicular, at a grazing incidence um, uh, to the 
to the incoming light. So basically parallel to the incoming light. Um, well, well, we have a movie on X-ray mirrors if you want to play it to the list. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Sure, that, that sure. Uh, yeah, worth a thousand that. words, I think, in that. Yeah. All righty. Oh, nope, don't play automatically. I'm not sharing my screen yet. All right. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, and there we go. Okay, so what are we looking at here? So we're looking at light that's coming from a distant source, and X-ray mirrors are these concentric shells that you're seeing on your screen. Um, and this is the grazing incidence that I was talking about. So basically, light needs to be focused. Not um, not scattered or not collected, but really focused onto the focal plane, which is the um, which is the cube that you're seeing in the back, where the instruments would be. So wow, look at that! Yeah, think about all of yeah. these little segments that are turned on their side and then um, just squeezed squeezed, squeezed into a small volume. And squeezed, is the yeah. is this size on the screen here between the mirrors? Um, what their equivalent it's are scale. in it's reality to scale yeah it's to scale yeah. so yeah so we could have mirrors that are separated by just a few millimeters or maybe a centimeter um, and many of these shells that are basically we pack it as much as we can so we have a lot of collecting area and the diameter of this of this mirror system can be only three meters but um it's collecting areas of course proportional to all these, all, all the inner areas of these segments put together. So, so, um, so yeah. Carol, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just want to clarify okay. something. So in the, in the sense of an optical telescope where, where it's characterized by its primary mirror diameter, like the JWST is on the left, an right. X-ray telescope, how was it, how was its X-ray light collecting ability characterized? Is it by the number of those shells or is it's, it by the equivalent of aperture? Basically. Uh, yeah. So, Obviously, the total diameter that you have plays a role in how many of these shells that, you, that um, you can pack in there. But we quote an effective area. So the equivalent of the mirror area that, um, that we can collect light at, at, at a given uh, photon energy. For example, at 1 keV, the current design that we are talking about for links would be able to collect um, about 2.3 square meters of the equivalent of an optical telescope. Okay, and and Alexi, when you were earlier talking about Chandra and you said it's a it was about a 15 meter or 15 inch telescope, is that what you meant? Inch. Yeah, that's what it yeah. is. Okay, yeah, all right. So so the effective collecting area would be equivalent to a 15 inch optical telescope in the case of Chandra, and in the case of Lynx, what was it again? Um, 2.3 square meters is, is our current, 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 uh, okay. current design, design. Okay. All right. Well, that and is... the diameter that we think we can pack that into, as long as the technology for these lightweight, thinner optics, not the ones that Chandra was built out of, the, mm -hmm. the, the um, thick shells, but um, just things that are much lighter, much more compact, and um, way less... Um, they, the diameter would be about three meters. Okay, and what what are, what are these things made of? What, what what would the shells in the reflecting area be made from? So we have uh, we have uh, several technological approaches under consideration. Uh, one is basically uh, thin thin layer sliced out of crystal silicon. Uh, this is a technology being studied at the, at the Goddard Space Life Center. Um, um, so you you make uh, many, many thousands of small elements. So individual elements are about uh, 10 by 10 centimeters. They are shaped as section of parabola and hyperbola. And then they put together on a structure that makes, you know, all these nested shells. So this design, I think it involves about 30,000 elements. So another approach is um, mirrors are made again in pieces but from glass similar to the glass on LCD screens. So the glass is shaped approximately through thermal uh, forming, um, the process called the slumping. And then uh, you adjust the uh, shape of those elements with additional active control 
elements put on the back of those mirrors. So these are like 20 by 20 centimeter pieces. And finally, a collaboration of uh, Brera Astronomical Observatory in Italy and Marshall Space Flight Center, they are looking at making thin shells out of big pieces of glass, basically by direct polishing, full shell, you know, three meter diameter, a couple of millimeters thin uh, optical elements. Okay, and and did you did we already say uh, earlier in the in the broadcast where links would live? Because I can't remember if we did or not. Where where are we going to send it? Orbit. Yeah. Yes, the orbit. Uh, we are tilting towards the L two Sun Earth L two pole. L two. That's the vacation spot for all space telescopes. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we we just finished our orbit study, and we were discussing earlier this morning what the recommendations are from the study office, but. I think Alexi's summary that we are tilting towards Alto is, is um, okay. And just to remind people, because I don't, I want to assume that everybody has seen all of our hangouts. Although that would have been nice. Uh, the the L two point is this area that fall. It's but it's a million and a half kilometers away from Earth, uh, where it follows the uh, Earth around its orbit uh, around the sun, and it's a nice convenient place uh, to put things because it's a stable point in the solar system. And uh, things, uh, as, as remember John Ehrenberg, uh, Alberto told us that it was like relatively free of a lot of debris and things like that as well. Yeah, it's a semi-stable point, so things don't want to stay there. So it's relatively clean, right? Yeah. But it's also energetically very favorable in a sense. We can, we can, we can like for JWST and other spacecrafts like that, we can have minimal energy to keep it uh, in an orbit around L2. So it's yeah, very, a very, very good place. Yeah. little note, the, uh, the individual Bob Farquhar, who is probably... Yeah. It's really legendary and was one of the advocates for decades of operations at the Libration Points. Uh, passed away not too many, not too long ago. Yeah. So, and uh, a little bit of memory every time somebody puts another mission at one of the sites that he identified. Um, I've got a, I got a question also for the, for the audience that when um, Lynx is selected or recommended by the Decadal Survey, actually that's a good point, Harley. Um, the Decadal Survey... <laughs> Not Does he ask questions himself? Yeah, he's Wait, what he's having miss? his own hangout, yeah. isn't Wait, what? he? Yes, what are you doing? Oh, how are you doing? I'm fine, Any, Harley. Thank case, you. The Decadal Survey, just to be clear for the for the audience, the Decadal Survey recommends um, does not do the selection. That's that's up to NASA. Um, the uh, but when Lynx is recommended by the Decadal Survey, um, uh, Alexi and Ferriel, what is the approximate time frame when it might be launched? As early as possible, of course. <laughs> I, I think we should put the money aside starting now and, and I, launch I'm it. Not gonna dis- I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> You'd like to identify from who knows Seriously, seriously uh, the, for all these missions, I think NASA envisions, envisions a period of uh, technology development. So top, top rated mission in, uh, in the decadal will receive a lot of support for for um, like closing closing the gaps on technology for a few years, right. and that would approximately coincide with the period of time as NASA completes the W first mission. So after W first is launched, the funding for the next flagship strategic mission might uh, you know might follow. Um, it probably will take at least five to six years to build a mission like Lynx. So if we start in the mid 2020s um, with W first winding down, then maybe early to mid 2030s would be the timeline for this right. next flagship mission. Okay, uh, and Bjorn Larson's wanting a little clarification on the uh, what the X-ray mirror was made out of. Uh, can you remind us, Alexi, what you said that that was what the the materials that it was so, made of? Glass or silicon crystal or, or crist- crystalline silicon. Okay, so it was. We... Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, we had another. We had a question from Adam Synergy uh, about Adam! Uh, studying studying black holes, <laughs> and uh, how many how many would Lynx find? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it's Adam so... Synergy, of course. <laughs> And the answer is all of them. No, I'm kidding. Go, go ahead. <laughs> That's actually very accurate. So, 
I love it. Yeah, good. Uh, the journalism oh. major strikes again. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, Carl, uh, while Ferial will be responding, there's a couple of graphics that you might want to show. It's absolutely on the of holes. There's two images. One is just shows uh, how black holes stand out in the X-ray images compared to the optical. And it's an image, not a video. It's it's an image, not a video. Okay. Okay. So in the meantime, I can maybe describe um, the different types of black holes that Lynx will be looking at. So we know of black holes that range from about 10 times the mass of our sun um, within our own galaxy to about, I mean, for example, what you're seeing on the screen right now, a billion times the mass of the sun. Uh, in fact, there have been discoveries of 10 billion solar mass black holes. Um, but these tend to be um, at higher redshifts that uh, when they're active, when they're actually accreting gas and matter from their environments, they light up and um, they, um, they become visible. So at different times in their lives, they can light up in the optical, uh, like the image that you're seeing from the Sloan survey on the left, or um, they can light up in the x-rays, which is like the image that you're seeing on the right from Chandra. Um, and it's, it, it's a function of the mass of the black hole, how rapidly it's accreting matter, how, how much it's eating, and just basically it's evolution. So we use these two different wavelengths and, and sometimes radio uh, wavelengths and uh, infrared also to map out exactly what black holes are doing. Um, Having said that, when we go to the early universe, when they are pretty small black holes, they are, they are going to become these supermassive black holes, but they haven't grown to those masses yet. Maybe they are 100, maybe 10 to the 4, um, 10,000 solar masses. Um, they are expected to be glowing in the X-rays. And we're talking now about red well, 9 or 10. Sorry, I'll call you my one show of the second image in the series. Sure. Uh, that's the sun... No, 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 no. It's on the black hole. Yeah, this one. That one right there. So right, There you all go. So um, we don't exactly know how these black holes start out, and that's one of the outstanding questions. How early do they form? How massive are they when they first form? But we, can, we have a wide range of theoretical models that basically um, – allow black holes to grow from different types of seeds under different settings and become the black holes that we see later on um, in the universe at earlier redshifts. So what we have here is a typical JWST field on the left where uh, these are the galaxies that we expect to find with JWST. Simulated, and it says. Yeah. Simulated, simulated, yeah. Well, yeah. yes, we expect to find. So this is not a real image. Um, in a typical field like that for JWST, if we then go and look at, um, at the space telescope like Lynx um, in the X-rays for 4 million seconds, for example, take a deep exposure of that, of that um, area. And 4 look million for seconds? Wow. That's what Chandra spent on its deepest exposures. I wasn't yeah. aware of that. That's a long exposure. That's amazing. <laughs> That's right. So, so for these deepest studies, um, we do allocate for at least several fields, up to maybe 10 fields, these large exposure times to be able to really see deeply into the universe. And um, there you see a, a, a mixture of, um, of X-ray sources that pop up that are expected to pop up. Again, it's a simulation. And um, we expect a fraction of these to be the baby supermassive black holes. So if we did a full survey... A baby of supermassive, people, I like that characterization. <laughs> that's what they're, they're just newborn, and they are going to become these baby supermassive black right. holes that really shape the galaxies that they live in. Um, and we expect to be able to find up to a thousand of these in our collection of deep exposures with links. We are uncertain about the exact number, precisely because of what I said about we, we don't really know how massive they are when they're born, how quickly they eat when they're first born. Um, <laughs> so all these parents' concerns that we have <laughs> yeah. be somewhere in the 100 to 1,000 of these very early black holes that, that we can find with links. Is the so what about... So I was going to ask, what about the other, the opposite? And what is the resolution? How small can you find them? So, okay. Um, 
we talked about the importance of collecting area, how, how big a telescope you need in order to be able to see or, um, farther away from you, so earlier in the universe, but there's also another concern. You have to have sharp vision. If you don't have sharp vision, which is the rightmost image that you're seeing on the screen right now, and everything is kind of blurry, then these individual source, X-ray sources that are black holes or X-ray binaries early in the universe blend together. You can't tell one apart from the other. So it really uh, makes you lose sensitivity very, very quickly. So if our mirrors got down to a resolution of only five arc seconds, it would be this blurry and not as illuminating image that you see on the right. And if we got to sub arc second resolution that we are hoping to achieve with links, and that's, that's one of the real goals of the light X-ray optics, then it would be the middle image where you can pick out each and every source down to a sensitivity limit of, I'll, I'll give you the number, um, it doesn't matter, but it's 10 to the minus 19. Of um, course it matters. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, okay. Yeah, so... So to understand what I'm looking at here, because the JWST is a infrared telescope, we're seeing the galaxies for right. a, a, a deep field that, that JWST might make, and within those galaxies, the same field, links will see these purple dots, which are signatures of a feeding black hole, correct? Correct. And yeah. you're hoping that you can get down and see to a level that lets you estimate their sizes and masses and energies and all of this other kinds of stuff, right? That's right. Um, how, how, what fraction of the galaxies had these black holes when, when they were first assembling? Um, and even the light that they emit, how much of an effect by, like you said, by um, estimating the energy of, that comes out of those black holes, we will also be able to learn how much of an effect they have on these nascent galaxies. And we're talking about, yeah, like you said, nascent galaxies. We're talking about the early universe here, right? Because JWST is looking at the first galaxies. This is, this is Redshift of 10. This is basically the very first generation of galaxies. This is before uh, the most of oxygen, most of hydrogen in the universe was reionized. Uh, the masses of those black holes are tiny by, you know, comparison of what we find in today's galaxies. So as Ferial said, today we find up to 10 billion solar masses of black holes. So the sensitivity of links is, um, it will be able to detect only 10,000 solar mass black holes at those very, very large distances. So like six orders of magnitude. Smaller. What about close by black holes, uh, Alexei? Are we interested in those at all or? Or can you get smaller ones that are closer, perhaps, like stellar-sized, or no? Uh, routinely, stellar-sized black holes we will find in nearby galaxies throughout the Milky Way. That's that's routine. We will. Okay, um, that's that's passe, is it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. It's not passe. What about? We'll be able to get a lot of information about the nearby yeah. black holes. And that's actually an interesting like suggestion that some of these early black holes, when they were born. Some of them were in the environments which were not uh, conducive to subsequent growth emerging. So we might have fossils of those early black holes in our cosmic neighborhood. Oh, yeah, so, and I was well, I, I, was just, I brought that up because with <laughs> with uh, LIGO and the gravitational wave events they found, they found a whole different uh, class of black holes, about thirty solar masses or so. And so right. I was just curious as to whether these whether links can help with that yeah. classification. Yeah, that was actually going to be exactly my question. Is there oh, any sorry, synergy with LIGO? No, no, it's okay. That's a perfect question, I think. Per Ooh, thank there's, you. There's a lot of synergy both with LIGO and a future, I mean, hopefully, that we will see in space. Um, Lisa? Oh, Lisa, yeah. yeah. Lisa, um, in the sense that, yeah, you're right, that LIGO completely revealed a new class of black holes that we didn't necessarily think existed um, around 30, 40, 50 solar masses. We knew of ones maybe around 10, 20 solar masses and then these giants. Um, so there is a huge amount of synergy there because as the mirrors grow and as, as our sensitivity improves with links, we will be able to see black holes in nearby galaxies and even um, in a lot of detail and to a much larger volume than, what, for example, what Chandra has been able to see. So uh, we might be able to see accretion signatures of LIGO-sized black holes. And similarly with LISA, 
if these early black holes undergo mergers and emit gravitational waves, Lisa will be able to find them. If they grow through accretion, the normal channel, then we will be able to see them. So there's incredible synergy there. Great. Uh, Carl, can I get you to stop screen- sharing your screen there and that's so I can get sure. people back up? And um, Okay, so, uh, I d- so Galaxia is commenting. Welcome back, Galaxia. I haven't seen you in a while. I'm glad to see you're back. Uh, she's saying um, that's the same as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the one million seconds that she's talking about. The thing is, it's different though, isn't it? Because when the Hubble takes an image for a deep field, it doesn't do it all in one exposure, does it? And I think here we are actually talking about one exposure and an X-ray image. You open the shutter for a four million seconds, right? Collect the no, no, no. no. Oh, you no, build it. Oh, okay. I'm glad. I'm glad I clarified that. I thought. <laughs> I yeah. thought you were. Inter- I thought you had to spend some time collecting these X-rays, but no. Yeah. Good work. There is Good one work. important difference. Yeah. You know, Hubble, when it takes its ultra deep images, it needs to stare at the same location very precisely for you know an extended period of time. Maybe not you know millions of seconds, but you know hours. But it doesn't. My point is, it doesn't just do it at one time. Right. It does it in chunks, yeah. and they build up the individual exposures. Yeah, to yeah, an yeah. equivalent but, of 100. But or... technologically, it's actually very important because in the X-rays, we count individual photons. And so we have, we don't need to keep the observatory at exactly the same location all the time. All we need to know is to know where it looks at a given you know, instant, right? And then we can reconstruct where the photon is coming from and accumulate the image this way. In fact, unlike Hubble, which stares at the same location, Chandra, for example, wobbles all the time by a little bit to smooth out all the imperfections on the detector. And that leads to just a simpler spacecraft design. This is some some of the advantages. Right. That so you don't need as high a precision pointing as something like JWST would need. Right. We actually would like to avoid very you know stable pointing because otherwise all the photons can come you know on a bad pixel on the detector, for example. Yeah. So we want to control wobbling. Interesting. Okay. Huh. All right. There are a couple of good questions, I think, that are related from Andrew Planet and Chuck Andrew Ritter, Rittersdorf. Um, can we tell the age of the black holes, even if they are small ones, uh, like the way we can with stars? And probably related to that, though I'm guessing, um, what what's the information you can get from X-ray, X-ray spectra? Okay, so can we tell the age of black holes? Within our own galaxy, we can, because those black holes accrete from their their companions, so they are in binary star systems, and we don't know the age of the black hole, but we can tell the age of the companion star, um, depending on its mass, so we can get a a good age for the black hole system, black hole um, stellar system itself. Uh, For example, at the center of our own galaxy, for Sagittarius A star, um, the 4 million solar mass black hole, again, its age is comparable to the age of our own galaxy. So going further back in time, we will be able to find their ages because the universe itself is going to be very young at that point. So um, I don't think we'll be able to tell within within several million years or so, but we can say, well, um, they need to be 100 million years old at most because that's the age of the universe at that point. So um, there are different ways we go about estimating the ages of black holes. Not exactly the way we do with stars, but similar. Also, this early universe evolves very, very fast. And so we we, we are aiming to track the history of, you know, population of black holes in those galaxies. So by tracking the history, we can infer let's say, average average age of those right. black holes. That's right. What was the second question? Can you um, that I thought it would kind of be related because I knew elements would develop slowly and we detect what elements are through spectra. And the question was, what spectra can we identify with? What information can we get from uh, um, X-ray spectra? Okay. Um, Alex, do you want to take it or do you want me to? Oh. Go, uh, go ahead. Okay, so... Um, in x-rays, we actually make use of spectra in several ways. It, even if we don't see individual lines of, of metals, um, ma- magnesium, oxygen, iron, whatever the case might be, um, we can determine a temperature because we know how these gases emit. We know how these black holes emit. 
black hole surroundings, I should say, black holes themselves don't emit. Um, so even if all you had was just the general shape of your spectrum, uh, you have a very good idea of the temperature of the gas that emitted it. And by doing some diagnostics, you can really uh, tell where it was, how fast it was moving, um, how hot it was. But on top of that, um, we now use, I mean, we, we have always been able to separate the light into finer components, either using gratings uh, by scattering the light and, and looking at the, um, the particular fluxes at individual wavelengths. And more recently with uh, microcalorimeters, which have even better energy resolution um, for some photon energies. And by separating them into these fine components, by looking at the detailed line spectra, um, we can also tell how, how much metals there are um, and just even how they got out there. Again, the velocity of those components. So um, it is a, it's very, X-ray spectroscopy can be very rich in information um, to tell us about just how that gas got to be there and how it's emitting. Carl, maybe you can play the uh, the movie which is called Coronal Mass Injection. Sure. That's from the YouTube. Okay. Uh, um, Peter so, Quinn is Peter Quinn is commenting. Can we just call the L point sweet spots and have done with it? Sure. <laughs> I'm all for that. The sweetie, L, the sweet spots. L sweet spots. <laughs> Les sweets. All right. <laughs> all right. Here comes the video. Right. So, so what you will see is the X-ray image of the sun, very active. No, no, no this one is, is good, right? So the processes on the surface is what powers the uh, solar corona that we will likely see. You know, hopefully we will see it next week. Uh, you know, in a gorgeous view. Um, so from the sun, what the information, the how we derive, how we study those processes is we look at at uh, various ionization states of element. We trace, uh, you know, um, what is the distribution of temperatures, densities in the coronal loops. So we we won't be able to get quite the same kind of data for different stars, but with links, we will be able to use exactly the same methods as astronomers use to study activity of the sun. And some of those stars are 1,000 times, 10,000 times more active than, than, than the sun. And uh, in the extreme cases, we expect that those flares, they affect the planetary system around us. I like so, how that, that planet was smoking. Spectroscopic science. So we'll derive the information from X-ray spectrum. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so did you, uh, Carl, you were commenting on the chat about something with Bjorn Larson. Did you want to ask something? Yeah. Um, so is I think Bjorn Larson, here, let me scroll real quick. Let me double check that I say his question correctly. Is there a distance limit to x-ray astronomy uh, astronomy because of redshift and oh, that's i said a good one. I like that. i'm not sure but i would think that the cmb uh the cosmic microwave background would be a distance slash time limiter for pretty much everything so there is a weak limit but not a strong one uh because most of x-ray spectra they are quite extended towards higher energies so for us uh in the optical astronomy, for example, the spectrum of a galaxy has a very big bump in the optical band, and so it has, has a redshift. If it's redshifted out of your observatory band, you know, you don't see the galaxy. It's not quite so with the X-rays because the spectra are more power low type, so they extend to higher energies. So as you place the source further and further out, you know, we see... Um, what we observe around the Earth is higher and higher energies in the source rest frame, but still, you know, it's uh, it's expected to be quite luminous. So we are talking about redshifts of 10 for detecting those uh, baby black holes. But if those baby black holes, you know, they are big and active, we can see them from redshifts of 15 or 20. Wow, that's pretty good. Okay, but uh, also, what you said, at, at very high redshifts, we will run into the cosmic microwave background um, when the 
I mean, beyond the last scattering surface, of course, we can't see x-rays. But um, anything short of that, there is no intrinsic limit, as Alexi was explaining. Okay. Adam Synergy, uh, will links be able to observe low luminosity, obscured, active galactic nuclei? Very good question. Uh, <laughs> so the, the low luminosity um, black holes tend to be actually quite X-ray active. The downside is they are low luminosity, so we would have a hard time seeing them at those very high redshifts that we've just been talking about. The upside is that of the total energy that they emit, a bigger fraction is in the X-rays, so um, we can certainly use them, uh, use links to study them um, in at, at least the nearby universe. Even Chandra has been able to see and study in, in quite a bit of detail low luminosity AGN, for example, in the Virgo cluster, and uh, links will be able to see uh, much further out compared to Chandra. Uh, we Lynx is projected to be, I mean, the requirement is to be about 1,000 times more powerful for doing surveys. So do your math. You know. okay. okay. Couple quick, couple quick, really good questions. Larry Keese, welcome back, Larry. Um, does Do CMEs cause loss of atmosphere? Now, they do cause mass loss for stars, at least our own sun, right? They're pretty massive when they come out. Do they? This is one of the questions we would like to address, and uh, okay. we believe it's it's uh, X-rays are quite unique because we can, through detailed spectral modeling, we can uh, have a pretty good idea, pretty good idea on the geometry and power of those injections happening in in, in other stars. This information is very hard to you know to derive otherwise. Um, in our own solar system, we believe that Mars has lost much of atmosphere due to, you know, activity of the sun, and sun is not very active. So, yeah, that's a good you know, point. And, and in, fact, in fact, the Earth has gone through a mass loss phase from its atmosphere. Um, and I don't know if there's consensus yet as far as whether it lost its entire atmosphere and then rebuilt it or, or lost it partially. Um, but certainly the activity of the central star has a big effect on the atmosphere of the planet, of the nearby planets. Good. And uh, so, yeah, it was a really good question. And if I remember right, uh, the CMEs from the sun, uh, they eject roughly 10 to the 22 grams of uh, material with each one. So it could be a, they, it could be a pretty significant uh, mass loss for the stars. So um, anyway, that's what I remember about CMEs. I'm up at Rath, Rath Bun. <laughs> Will links be able to detect if dark energy comes from black holes? Dark energy, by the way, is this thing that people think is responsible for the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Don't know what it is beyond that. Yeah. To the best of our understanding, dark energy doesn't, or black holes don't have the properties to be able to account for the dark energy that we see through um, type 1A supernovae, through uh, our CMB measurements. So um, I don't really know how to answer that question because there isn't a feasible theory of how black holes could be responsible for dark energy. Um, but if there is one, we could certainly do uh, studies of how um, X-rays might be affected. Yeah, I so think the if places... If anybody has a better, better answer, please go ahead. Well, right now, I think the way that the dark energy is being characterized is by the large-scale structure of the universe, pretty much, right? Where these galaxies are lining up and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and how they're being shaped by the, the dark matter and the other stuff in the, in the universe. Um, and yeah, even are... black holes might be able to provide some kind of, I don't know, indirect evidence of, of dark energy. Yeah, there are several ways of, um, of probing dark energy. We can look at distant objects and see how they dim compared to how we expect them to dim, given their distance. Um, we can look at, like you said, the large-scale structure of the universe, the uh, visible matter, um, and look at how baryons have been affected by this. Um, and we can look at the cosmic microwave background, look at the flatness of the universe and the total matter content, and by comparing the two, look at what's left over, and that's what we assign to um, dark energy. 
So um, these three methods give roughly comparable amounts of dark energy. And we, like I said, it, there isn't a, really a feasible way of attributing that to black holes. Right. And I won't, I, I don't, probably shouldn't read this guy's handle so i won't but he goes so uh, will links be able to detect redshift for the x-ray range and if so and if so uh could binary black holes spinning be detected that way that's a good question when you look at x-rays can you see redshift in x-rays yes yes awesome we do see it already today with chandra, with chandra. so line, you know when you have spectral lines in the in the source you can uh, you know you routinely see that the lines are shifted the reds, and, so. and broadened uh, because of relativistic effects. Yeah. The the lines are actually wider in the spectra. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Well, that's no, they're good. They're wider. They are red shifted. So you re you usually start probing the black hole environment by looking at those spectral lines. Okay. Well, with the few minutes we have left, I want to ask you a quick question about the wh about what's next for you. And then while I'm doing that, Carl, if you can maybe line up a if there's any more left over after that, I'll I'll, I'll get to you. But um, so we've talked about the process of the Decadal Survey many times. People know what that is. You guys have made your science case or making your you're deciding your science case. Where are you now in the process, and what can we expect next? I would say we're working on multiple parallel threads. Um, we are at a very good point in defining our science case and translating them to observatory requirements, both for the optics and for the instruments. Um, the study office is doing a fantastic job of taking all of this and designing uh, an actual observatory out of it. Um, I think Alberto was uh, getting at this earlier on in our um, in our conversation that designing a spacecraft has a lot more elements than just what the, the mirrors and the and the um, detectors will look like um, the launch vehicle the thermal stability the orbit which we've talked about already many different considerations so our Study offices are working on this. Individual groups around, not just around the U.S., but around the world are, are working on the different technology elements that are necessary. Um, so we're going to keep pushing forward on all of these fronts in a, for the next year or so and um, hopefully have a pretty mature mission concept by the time we submit it to the decadal. Great. And the... What, what? Go ahead, Can Alexi. I... Yeah, one area, one area is, uh, you know, in addition to uh, several pillars that we've identified, Lynx is expected to be able to observe phenomena basically throughout astrophysics. Even if when, uh, you know, astronomers didn't use X-rays before, they will be. So one of our uh, areas of work is to collect all this great observatory science and put it together in a meaningful form. You, you know what I think that we, they should do, Harley and Alberto, is that I think NASA should let the the, the public vote on which mission they want more, and <laughs> and also name it like Linksy McLinks face or something too. You know, let us let us like name. Let's it. get the Colbert uh, module all this. over again, which I'm okay with. But. That's a slippery slope. <laughs> although, right. although, in fact, NASA has NASA has polled the public on solar system uh, missions and i do not know what the fate was but the public does have a, have a role to play. i know i was being facetious but it's still it'd be funny you know to like when they name they name these spacecraft so so we don't know yet really what a um what, what launch vehicle this thing might be going on it's too early for that right They've, I'm sure our folks will, well, well Alexi and Carol can answer. They, I think, I'm sure they've given some serious thought. They should know how big of a launch vehicle they need, right? Um, it, it ranges from, uh, from, um, like, uh, Atlas V, heavy configuration of Atlas V to Delta IV, probably will launch it comfortably. Yeah. Uh, we probably don't require SLS be able to launch it. Which okay. is the big heavy lift uh, um, vehicle that NASA is developing primarily for its plans to go to Mars. That's, That's right. It. Yeah. Right. Uh, kind of along those lines, uh, what what would be the fairing size that y'all are looking at? Because that also kind of helps imagine what you might be able to put it on top of. That's right. So we talked about the three meter diameter for the mirrors. Um, that would, that would be uh, housing like 2.3 square meters of effective area. 
and that fits comfortably into the fairing of all these launch vehicles yeah, that, that Alexei listed. And as far as the length goes, a focal length of about 10 meters also fits relatively well into um, all of these launch vehicles. Would that be able to fit? Well, at, uh, the Vulcan is basically a, a, a bigger, more powerful atlas, but what about uh, the uh, the Falcon 9's fairing? You obviously have to make it a Falcon Heavy, which hasn't flown Falcon yet. Falcon but... Heavy, if it's the same as Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy fairing is a little short, but we might consider extendable bench, you know, yeah, awesome. Or, or, or asking Falcon Heavy to be a little bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just yeah, engineer a bigger rocket, please? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a Delta Four fan because I worked out at Stennis for a year. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, any more questions, Carl? We're out of time, but I yes. Okay. Um, very quickly about the hardware. Um, will this uh, will it be serviceable? And that is from hmm, uh, Andrew Planet. We are required to consider servicing because of congressional policy. So we don't quite need servicing, except for maybe uh, putting more capable detectors in the future if they are available. So, but we don't have, uh, we don't have exp ex expendables. That requirement came after JWST, didn't it, uh, Alberto? It did, it was in 2010. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. I thought so. Yeah. By the way, we have to acknowledge the, the two spot supporting organizations. Of course. It's, I thought we had done that. You did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, by all means. Who? Go ahead, Harley. All right. we, we want to acknowledge the support from the pair of AASs, the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society. They, the, the opinions and views presented here are of the individuals themselves um, and are not necessarily endorsed by the pair of AASs. That's right. We should have said that at the top of the hangout. I thought we did. Okay, good. Uh, and do you have our mascot handy? Yikes. Okay, because we got to talk about this is our gravitational rubber ducky. He floats on gravitational waves in space time so that you don't have to. <laughs> don't I found wise. this one. Don't know why I said that. Uh, okay. Uh, rubber ducky. Yeah, there we that go. That was gold, Tony. <laughs> oh. Okay. I the ghost. 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 What do you got? Hold on. Let me put you up. Go ahead. Do it again. I don't know. Oh, don't there we go. It. Okay. <laughs> we got all kinds oh. of stuff. All right, folks. Now, yeah, my three eyed friend better than what? Uh, totally yeah. professional. We are nothing. Alberto always has toys. He's got the greatest toys. Hey, you know what? <laughs> at Halloween, once I saw someone at Goddard dressed up as a Jedi on Halloween Day. It was amazing. So, ah, and don't very good. Forget for proper eye uh, protection on Monday. Ah, yes. Monday is a big solar eclipse day. I don't know about you guys. I'm kind of looking forward to this thing to being over. <laughs> it's like it has been consuming my, my, my life here for the past few uh, weeks. It will be over. You have no control over it. Yes, I know that. So that's good. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I want to take a moment to thank our guests. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, Dr. Feryal Ozil. From, she's an astronomer from the University of Arizona. Thank you for joining us, Fer Feryal. Uh, Alexi, Dr. Alexi uh uh, Vic, Vic Lennon, he is an astronomer also at the uh, Harvard or the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. So, well, Great thank you, Alexi. Yeah. I appreciate your time. I hope that you will keep us uh, keep us posted on future developments. And when the Decadal Survey comes out, everybody's gonna. I don't know. Is it gonna be like the Super Bowl where you have this big party for the winner, and then everybody else has these consolation? Uh, um, Sad, well, we, we, we certainly would like to see more than one great observatory in space. I think the four great observatories that NASA put up really showed us the richness of the astrophysical phenomena. So we really need to be doing that. It's just a matter of funding, prioritization, et cetera. But and time. I'd like to see all of them succeed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be that would be the best of all possible worlds. Just get them all up yeah. there. That would be great. Have yeah. no choice. Uh, um, but uh, okay. Well, I guess with that, we so you've seen them all, folks. All of the major no, projects. We we'll have one more next month. Will be the the habitable exoplanet surveyor, Habex. Oh, okay. Good, yeah, yeah. awesome. So next, there you go. Next next month, we'll be we'll be talking about the Habex and the Habex mission and seeing what they're going to be doing as well. So I want to thank everybody for attending. Alberto, it was good to see you again, my friend. I want at some point, guys, JWST. Yes, I'm you working know, on that. it's getting on there. It's starting to happen. We got to talk about it more. Come on, Alberto. What's holding you up? We got to no, talk. That's about easy. That's easy to do. Let's <laughs> set it up. Tell me when. All the right. one after Habix. There you go. 
Okay, the one after Habex. Let's do that. That sounds great. Let's do that. Let's All right, I'm guys. Doing. Well, I will uh, want to thank you, everybody, for taking time out to watch our Hangout. We'll see you guys next week where we will be talking, I think, with members of the Dark Energy Survey, but I'm not sure, in our Astro Coffee Hangout next Thursday. Be safe with the eclipse. You can only look at it safely during totality. Anytime else, you can't. you got to have special help. Don't look directly at it and get blind. We will see you on the other side of the eclipse next week where we will hopefully all have survived it and we don't, we aren't all blind. So anyway, thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Keep looking up when the dragon devours the sun. Um